So welcome. <laughs> I hope I do pastry. <laughs> Excellent. So my name is Phil Walford and I've been invited along to talk to you about what you need to do, planning for the future for your child, to protect your child. Quite a big subject. Um, I do two talks on this, uh, both about two and a half hours, and I've had to shrink two and a half hours into <laughs> half an hour. Uh, so it's going to be quick, pretty quick. Uh, it's a whistle-stop tour of everything you need to do, so it's just all of the highlights. I'm not going to drill down into anything, but this afternoon I'm running two sessions, so you can come to those if, if you like to get a bit more information. So just a quick bit about Renaissance Legal. Um, ironically, we are in Brighton, very close to where Tracy lives, and I actually know her cousin, <laughs> which is really odd. Until about a week ago, I didn't even realise. So uh, we are Solicitor's Firm. Uh, we specialise in working with families like you to make sure that children, or indeed siblings or parents, are protected where they are vulnerable. <coughs> like I said, we are, bless you, we are based in Brighton, but we've got offices near um, Gatwick, one in East Croydon, and one in London, Euston. So we try and cover quite a lot of the country. Um, we work extensively with the, lots of local and national charities just to make sure the message gets out to people like you about what you can and can't do. Because it's all about knowledge, it's all about what you should do, because there are things that actually you, you, you must do, which I'm going to touch on today. It's about giving you the knowledge and, and passing that on, and then we can do the work for you if you like. Um, so, like I said, we've got half an hour to get through a lot. Uh, we're going to start with some, just some general thoughts. We're going to look at a will, a trust, mental capacity, look at powers of attorney, court of protection, family scenario. I will get through it all, I promise you. <laughs> it sounds like a lot. It will make sense when we get towards the end. So, starting with some common thoughts, and this is, this is sort of leading us towards um, why we're here, you know, in this section of, of today and what we need to achieve. So the starting point really is, is to think about if we've got a child who is potentially vulnerable, uh, potentially claiming means-tested benefits, and potentially got capacity issues, we can't actually leave them our assets. So if you think about means-tested benefits, for example, so means-tested benefits, actually there's a lot of the news this morning about universal credit, but means-tested benefits, you can think about one of the most obvious ones, which is housing benefit. That is there to pay for rent, to pay for your child to live in their own home or whatever shared accommodation they might be in. So the general principle with means-tested benefits is we do not want someone to have more than £6,000 in their name because if they do, then their means-tested benefits package is compromised. So if I die and I leave money to my child, then it's a complete waste of money. Because all that's going to happen is my child drops out of the means tested benefits, spends all my money, and then goes back in again. So what we need to do is just make sure that everything I give, I leave, when I die, goes into a trust. Yeah. Equally, if we've got someone who's vulnerable, either because their eyesight's failing or because of their hearing, the vulnerability, we want to make sure that we protect that vulnerability. And again, not give them our money, but give it into a trust so it can be managed for them. So the starting point here is, is to think that when we pass on, we don't want to leave our assets to our child, but we need to put our assets into a trust. The next thing is, again, about a trust. We often come across situations where there are quite a few children, and actually parents might think, well, actually, why don't I leave it to the child who doesn't have the, the vulnerability? So say I've got Zach, who is my 19-year-old child who is vulnerable, and I've got Tom, who isn't. If I left everything to Tom, you know, you might think, well, actually, that's quite a simple answer. That gets around everything. But that's completely the wrong thing to do. Because if Tom then de de gets declared bankrupt, you know, potentially all of that is gone. If Tom divorces, his wife will be claiming quite a lot of that inheritance. So again, that's gone. If Tom dies, he might be leaving everything to his wife, and that goes off to somebody else. And again, the provision for Zach is gone. And you can never safeguard against a family fallout. So, again, we're looking at actually making provision for my vulnerable child, for my Zach, making sure that it's ring-fenced for him and putting it in the trust. And the final thing, just on the common thoughts, is that alongside everything we're doing from a, from a legal point of view, we also need to think about the practical side. So that some of the practicalities is, well, actually, where will my child live when I'm not around anymore? So if I'm caring for my child and my child's living at home with me and I drop down dead today, where's my child going to go? And it's not a legal principle, but it's very important alongside the trust and all the planning you're doing to think about what that looks like. So we're not saying you've got to you know, guarantee a place somewhere, but you've got to think about what does that place look like and maybe leave some instructions with those people who are left behind. So we're sort of empowering everyone who's left behind with that information. 
And if you've got a younger child, you might want to attach uh, the EHCP to all of the papers. Again, not necessarily a strict legal thing, but it's capturing everything you've got in your head, all of the thoughts and wishes, and making sure you're passing that on as a bundle to those people who are left behind. So that's our starting point. Um, then we move on to think about, okay, well, we've got those principles in our head. You know, a will, we all know that we should have a will. Actually, who here, who here, who here has a will? Yeah, not a huge amount. Okay, who here has made a will in the last five years? Because that's the important thing, because it all changes. Okay, fantastic. Okay, gold star at the front then. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, no, not a gold star there. Well, you've come to the right place. <laughs> Uh, so the thing with a will is, is that everybody must have a will, but also you need to keep it up to date because the law changes so frequently. So the starting point to worry you, um, for those people who don't have a will, is that there are some instructions, uh, some, some sort of legal principles that, that dictate what happens to our estate if we die without having left a will in place. They're called the intestacy provisions and they're actually simply not great. They're a broad brush trying to, to cover the whole country, the whole diversity of assets, family relationships, but they simply do not work for us where we have a child who is vulnerable and claiming means tested benefits. So what the principles say is that if you are married or in a civil partnership, which is quite topical now because we're now going to get civil partnerships for heterosexuals over homosexual couples. So if you are married or in a civil partnership and you die, your partner or your husband and wife only receives the first £250,000 worth of assets and then half the remainder. But the important thing is that that other half goes off to our children at the age of 18, which completely is damaging for our child. So as we said, we've got a vulnerable child, we've got a child claiming means tested benefits, we do not want our child to inherit anything. But equally, living down south, if I've got a property worth £500,000 and I fail to make a will, my wife doesn't inherit my property. So not only have I messed up my child, my vulnerable child's situation, but I've actually messed up my wife's situation because she doesn't inherit a family home. And technically, in theory, albeit probably unlikely, she could be kicked out of my home. So these principles are simply not appropriate for us. We cannot rely on them. So everybody here who has a vulnerable child has to make a will. Sorry, I know, <laughs> I know you're gruesome, but you've got to do it. The other thing is when we're making a will, we're going to actually make some choices. We're going to choose guardians for our children if our children are under 18. We're going to choose the executives, we're going to choose the trustees. All things which enable us to make the choices rather than the law saying what's going to happen. Um, and we're going to make provision for our family. So the next thing is when you're making a will, you might need to think about inheritance tax planning. Um, inheritance tax is not the funnest subject at Saturday morning at nearly 12 o'clock. However, uh, it is important, again, alongside everything you're doing, to think about what the inheritance tax side might be. You know, it's a very general principle. We each have our inheritance tax threshold of 325,000 when we die. Um, there are some, you know, lots of exemptions about those sort of things. But inheritance tax is payable at a rate of 40%, and that's a massive loss. So again, alongside what you're doing, you might need to think about inheritance tax planning. And then you're going to make a will because you want to ensure that your wishes are followed and you are going to protect your child. Okay, and that's the important thing about a will. So we've started off by thinking about um, what some general principles are and then we've got into our heads, we simply have got to make a will. We cannot not have a will. So, knowing that our, our assets can't pass to our child because they're vulnerable or because they're claiming means-tested benefits, what we need to think about is what that trust structure looks like. So there are quite a few reasons why you might use a trust. Um, there's a few of them there on the board. You might use it for tax planning. For us, we're protecting uh, the means-tested benefits and we're protecting our, our vulnerable child. But lots of people use trust for care purposes, care fee protection, you know, you, you hear a lot of that in the news. So lots of different reasons why a trust is always going to be the answer. For us, the trust is going to look like this and then the next picture that we look at. So every single trust looks exactly the same. So to be legal and to be a trust, it has to have these three entities. So we've got the trustees, and the trustees are the people who manage the trust. Your minimum trustees are two, and your maximum is four. You can have friends, family members, professional people, mixture of that, um, but the trustees are just doing what the trust document allows them to do. They are controlling the trust. 
Being a trustee is just a job, so when you don't want to be a trustee anymore, you retire. If you're naughty, you can be kicked off. You know, there's, there's a complete succession of trustees. Over on our left-hand side, we've got the assets in a trust. Largely speaking, any assets can be held in a trust, other than things like ISAs, because they're individual savings accounts. But you can put property in a trust, you can put cash, you can put stocks and shares. And equally, when the trustees get those assets in, so if I put my £500,000 house into a trust, the trustees can sell that house and convert it into cash and invest it. Equally, if I put cash in the trust, the trustees can buy a house and permit my child to live in it. So there's lots of flexibility about what the trustees can do with trust assets. And over uh, on our right-hand side, we've got the beneficiary or indeed beneficiaries of the trust. So you have to be in the beneficiary bubble to be able to benefit. You have to be named in that bubble. And you can name someone in the bubble by using just general descriptions like <coughs> children or grandchildren, because as long as it's identifiable what that description relates to, that is absolutely fine. So you don't have to name individuals, you can name them in a nieces and nephews general context. So every trust you come into contact in your lifetime will always look like that, will always have those three entities. And sometimes the trust asset might just be a £10 note stapled into a trust deed, but it's still a trust asset, so you still have to have that. So from our point of view, um, and we are going through everything very quickly, and I'm not going to take hours to explain this, but from our point of view, we have got to go for a discretionary trust. So our trust picture, in this case, just shows quite a few potential beneficiaries over there. And the reason why it does that is, is to create this concept of a discretion. So the problem we've got with our beneficiary, let's say, let's take that means tested benefit issue, because that's the easiest one to think about. If we're claiming means tested benefits, on the claim form it says a question worded largely to say, do you have the right to benefit from any assets held in trust? And if we use this diagram, like it says there, it says capital and income is advanced to the beneficiaries at the discretion of the trustees. So when we're using that means test and benefit analogy, we are saying our vulnerable child there does not have the right to benefit from assets held in trust. So we don't have to tick that box, so means test and benefits are not prejudiced in any way, because the trustees have to exercise a discretion to take assets out and to use them or give them to any of the people there. And it's that discretion which protects that means tested benefit. So if there were no, if there was only my vulnerable child there, there is completely no discretion because that's the only person who can benefit from the trust. So means tested benefits are compromised. The additional problem with that is if the picture looks like this, then anything coming out of the trust has to go into this person's bank account. And again, that can create problems if someone's vulnerable. Whereas if we've got this diagram, because we've got this discretion and this degree of flexibility, what we can actually do is buy things for this person. So we can buy them their season ticket to my club, Brighton and Hope Albion. You were doing quite well for your West Ham last night. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, or, you know, paying for, we've got lots of beneficiaries where, where the young ladies and the parents will say, well, actually, you know, every month take her and have her hair done or her nails done or something nice. So buy a holiday for her. So rather than putting money through this person's bank account, we can use it for them. And that's much more effective. So a discretionary trust is absolutely the type of trust we go for. The way you decide what this category looks like is to ask yourself the question that, when your vulnerable person dies, if there's any fund left here, where does it go? And like I keep saying, you have to be in the beneficiary bubble to be able to inherit. So your answer to that question is, well, maybe it goes to my grandchildren or my other children or nieces and nephews, or indeed to charity. You know? So you can easily shape up this category by asking yourself, if your child dies and there's any fund left in the assets, then where does it go? And the answer to that is this category here. So discretionary trust is absolutely what we need to use. So what we've said with the discretionary trust is that it's protecting means tested benefits. We're providing for our child, but actually we're protecting their vulnerability. And if later on they, they develop, or if, even if now they've got capacity issues, we're protecting those as well. Now, the downside of a discretionary trust is that it is penalised for tax purposes. Big sigh, it's a complete nightmare. Again, I'm not going to dwell on it hugely, but just to give you some tips on that. For income tax, 
If there is, uh, let's go back to the picture, um, if there is assets here which, which generate income, for income tax, that is taxed at 45%, which is massive. Capital gains tax is charged at either 20 or 28%. And if the value of these assets exceed 325,000 pounds, which if I'm putting my 500,000 pound property in there, it would, then there is an inheritance tax charge every 10 years at a rate of 6% on the value over 325. So my Zach is 19, and so I might have 80 years worth of, of uh, trust. So I'm gonna have eight lots of charge for inheritance tax purposes. So discretionary trusts are penalized for tax purposes. And that's deliberate because discretionary trusts are often used to pass on wealth through generations. So what we can do, so it's not all bad, so that gives you the bad news, and I'm gonna tell you the good news. Um, so what we can do is we can upgrade our trust to something called a disabled person's trust. So it is still a discretionary trust, but what we do by upgrading, and again I'm gonna take you back to that picture, what we do by upgrading is we say this person is deemed disabled by definition of law. The definition of law says to be a disabled person, for our purposes here today, yeah, your disabled child has to get DLA care component at the middle or high rate, and mobility or, or mobility component at the high rate, or PIP, either of the two components at either of the two rates. So it captures everybody. For us today, it's quite easy. So we know everybody that we're dealing with will be deemed disabled by definition of law. So what that means is that we can upgrade from a discretionary trust to a disabled person's trust. So a disabled person's trust is a discretionary trust. It looks exactly like that. But what you do is wipe out all of that penalising tax treatment. Yeah? Brilliant. Yeah, great. Round of applause for the person who told it, yes. <laughs> oh, I didn't think you were going to do it. <laughs> okay, so, so we're all going for a disabled person's trust. Okay. Um, so the thing with the disabled person's trust is that you do lose some of the flexibility on what you can use the money for. So again, sorry, just taking you back to the picture. With a discretionary trust, the trustees could at any time give any, of the, any, any assets to any of these people here. Because it's discretionary, they can do that. The great thing about disabled person's trust is to get that tax benefit, the benefit that we want to have, the trustees can only give up to £3,000 per year to the whole of this category down below. So from my point of view, that's brilliant, because it means that with this trust, I know that the trustees are always going to use the assets for my vulnerable child. Yeah, so it's great. I'm getting the tax benefit, and I know I'm limiting what the trustees can do. So just in case they go rogue on me, I know that, that this person is still going to be safe. So we're going to upgrade, it's going to be a discretionary trust, but we're going to upgrade it to a disabled person's trust. Brilliant, excellent. So, that is the first two and a half hours covered in 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, and that's the first bit of this afternoon, I'm doing a two to three session on this, lots more on that. So if you want to hear more, that's this afternoon. This next bit is the second bit of this afternoon, the second two and a half hours. So. Having got in our heads that we need to do wills and trusts, vaguely understood what they mean, we now need to think about the capacity side, about mental capacity, about the flexibility of that. Mental capacity in a legal context is about your capacity to be able to make decisions. Making decisions is massive. My decision last night whether I had a single gin and tonic or a double gin and tonic is one of the, one of the decisions. Um, and equally, did I have you know, two pastries and a bacon sandwich this morning or not? So, you know, capacity can be massive. Capacity then to make an investment in the stock market is at the other end of the spectrum. So capacity, you know, can be massive. It's choices we're making all the time. For us, we don't even, we, you know, those choices are not even thought about. But for someone who has more limited capacity, that is important. So what we need to do on a mental capacity point of view is to think about what are we asking someone to do? Can they do it at the time we're asking them to do and with assistance? So what we're doing is we're trying to facilitate everybody to make decisions that they possibly can. There's lots about mental capacity, but I'm just going to give you some highlights. The main highlight comes from the Mental Capacity Act of 2005. It tried to bring together lots of law and lots of mess in the law up until that time. 
So it took quite a long time to come into effect. When it was going through Parliament, it started off being called the Mental Incapacity Act, which was rubbish because you were just reinforcing you know, the negativity of capacity. Someone at the final moment just realised that that was the wrong thing and changed it. But when it came into effect in 2005, it then largely took two years to get properly into the legal stream about what you can and can't do with it. So that's how far-reaching it was. The great thing about us was that it put in place five core principles that relates to everything that we do when we're helping someone who is vulnerable. The starting point is to say that everybody has a presumption of capacity. So again, we're looking at what are we asking someone to do? Can they do it? That's the starting point. We're saying that they have capacity unless proven otherwise. So you're not guilty unless proven innocent, you're innocent unless proven guilty. You know, it's really empowering to say this person has capacity. So what the life change for me is that when we get um, uh, a diagnosis of things like Down syndrome or something, you know, quite a lot of people are negative about a piece of paper that says this person's Down syndrome. So suddenly everybody checks out, you know, mentally checks out and says, you've got Down syndrome, you can't do all of these things. Well, I've got Down syndrome clients who work. I've got Down syndrome clients who can make lots of decisions. Okay, they may not be capable of investing and managing stock market portfolio, but there's a whole lot of stuff that they can do. So it's about empowering people to do things. And that's reinforced by principle number two that says all of the professionals around your child and around anybody who's vulnerable need to try and maximize decision making. And maximizing decision making and doing things like thinking about the time of day that's right for someone to make a decision, thinking about the surroundings, thinking about the, the form of communication. So like we've got the speech loop in here, if we didn't have it, you know, then someone may not have capacity. With the speech loop, you know, it may do. Braille, you know, all of those things are really important. So all of the professionals around us need to make sure that we try and facilitate someone to make these decisions. The next thing is that if we have capacity, and this is a quite a funny one, if someone has capacity, they can make unwise decisions. So I had capacity last night, and my capacity was single or double gin. Uh, this has been filmed, actually. This is going to be really bad. <laughs> I'm just using it as an example. Um, so, uh, so, <laughs> yeah. so unwise decision or wise. If I've got capacity, I have the right to make an unwise decision. So, you know, so that's a very, very difficult thing that, that with lots of parents, what we're trying to do is, is enable our child to do lots of things, but then when they make a choice that we don't agree with, we're trying to say, well, actually, let's pull them back. But actually, if they do have capacity, they can make their own mistakes. And that's tough as parents, actually, to see your child making a mistake. I know my parents still don't like me making mistakes, so, you know, it, doesn't, it never ceases. Um, so the first three is, is about someone perhaps who has capacity and about achieving that capacity. The next two um, are about someone who doesn't have capacity. So the first thing is that if someone does not have capacity, we working around them have to do things in their best interests. So what's best interest for me is going to be de very different for you because we're all different. And just to give you an example of that, I was out for, for dinner with a professional colleague on Thursday night and she had a best interest problem with the local authority and the local authority hadn't taken account of this woman's very strong religious beliefs. And they made a best interest decision about where she went and lived. And basically what they did is they removed her very, very a long way away from the mosque that she needed to visit you know, every day or so. And so what they didn't take into account was for her, rather than for us, for her, the best thing possible was that she went in an environment very close to her, you know, her, her natural setup. And so the best interest could be challenged and the local authorities could be challenged about it and it will be overturned, you can guarantee, because they failed to take that into account. So best interest is about what is right for you, what your history is, your preferences, but it's about choosing what is right for you and not what's right for us. And the final point here is that if we are helping, if we're making decisions for someone who does not have capacity, we have to make the least restrictive choice. So an example of that would be to say that if someone was vulnerable and they were in a, a care environment, locking the door and not enabling them to go out is the most restrictive. But putting in place a care package which enables them to leave home with a carer or PA or whatever is the least restrictive. So everything we're doing has to be the least restrictive option where someone doesn't have capacity to make decisions for themselves. 
So mental capacity is massive. It comes into every single thing we're doing. You know, we, we're naturally doing it all, all the time. Now, the really important thing, and this, you know, when I'm reading about Wolfram, um, I don't think I can capture as much reading as I get from being here, but the really, really important thing for me, for you guys today, is that if your child is over 18 and your child has capacity, then they absolutely must make a power attorney. I just, I can just see it, you know, five minutes with, with you and your, you know, your children, I can see how important this is. And actually, Dr. Tim, was it Tim who was on earlier? Yeah, yeah, he came up to me and said, all powers of attorney, you're going to talk about that because that's so important from his point of view. So a power of attorney is a document where you delegate authority to someone to take decisions for you if you need help. So I can delegate, I can do a power of attorney to my wife, to my children, whoever. For your children, when they get to 18, this is going to be vitally important because they are going to be able to delegate to you choices in relation to their financial affairs and if they lose capacity in relation to health and social care. So it's really massively important and you know as Dr. Tim said to me, that's the sort of thing that the doctors, the GPs, whoever come in, you know, really need us to do as a legal profession to encourage you to get it done. So it's really important. You have to be over 18 and you have to have capacity. So again, from my point of view, if someone is 18 and they've got Wolframs and they've got capacity, we need to do it immediately. You know, I get families coming to me at 17 and three quarters to book the appointment, you know, the moment someone's got to 18. It doesn't matter if they can't see because we can read it to them. It doesn't matter if they can't sign their name, they can sign by a cross, you can sign by a front print, and someone can sign on your behalf. So the vision is not a problem. Hearing, again, if, if there's a way to, to do things in Braille or whatever, you know, it's, that is all fine. But this, as, as parents, this is so important for you. Um, also, it's a lot cheaper, quicker, easier than going to the Court of Protection. Um, the fees involved are cheaper. If you've got means-tested benefits, you probably won't have to pay the Office of the Public Guardian fee, which is £82 for registration of each document. Um, you can download the forms from the government website. Uh, if you go to a lawyer, you might be looking at £500 or something to do these. But, you know, a lasting power attorney for me is the most important thing your child can do. So yes, you have got to do a will. Yes, you've got to do a trust. Yes, you've got to do your planning for the future. And yes, your child, if they can, needs to do a power of attorney the moment they get to 18. If they can't do a power of attorney, or indeed if you have left it too late, or something else has gone wrong, then your only recourse is to go to the Court of Protection. The Court of Protection is what it says. It is a court, and it protects people who are vulnerable. So we only go to the court where someone does not have capacity to make their own decisions. And we only go to the court, as you normally would, for the correction of something that's gone wrong. So one of the things that people do really just get in their head, which is completely wrong, is that you can go to the court for an order just in case the local authority messes up or just in case the carer does something wrong. You know, when you think about the court, the court is there to sort out divorces, criminal procedures, boundary disputes, contract disputes. Something has to have gone wrong for us to go to the court. And that's the really unfortunate thing for us, that, that something has to go wrong with a family member, either be it health or finances, for us to go to the court and ask for the court's help. Um, again, more on this this afternoon, so I'm just giving you an overview. But largely, what we would go to the court for is to become the deputy for our child. And the deputy is the same as an attorney, is standing in our child's shoes, is taking decisions for our child about what they do in relation to financial matters, or indeed the health and social care. So it is really important, but if we can get the power of attorney done, we don't need to go to the court. And anything about the court um, is always going to be more expensive, more time consuming, it's going to be a big headache. So again, that's why I keep reiterating, if we can do a power of attorney, we absolutely must. But the court of protection is there as a backup if we need it. Um, I've put there applying at the right time again, you know, it's making sure that, that unfortunately something's gone wrong because if you apply too early, the court will just throw out your application. The court's starting fee is £400. Um, you can get some fee exemptions, but that, you know, again explains how, how costly it is. And generally, unless there's a, de a desperate emergency, things take at least six months to get out of the court. Um, so it's, a, it's a, lot of, a lot of headache. So, we're just wrapping up. 
Am I still okay on time? Oh, I think we're on time. Okay, so I've just used a general example here. We've got parents who have a child with Wolfram who's 19. What should they do now? So, the first thing is the parents have to do a will. Yeah, we all know that. That's absolutely right. The testing rules are not going to work for us. The parents have to do a trust because the money that's coming from us to our child needs to go in a trust structure. Then, that child with Wolfram, if they can, needs to do a power of attorney. And if not, we need to consider whether we provide to the court of protection or not. Possibly not, right at this moment in time, but we know that there is a backup. So, that's my two sessions this afternoon. So the first session, two to three, we've got wills, the trusts, that sort of financial you doing stuff. The second section, four till five o'clock, uh, that's going to be a bit tough after a whole day uh, for all of you, five o'clock listening to a lawyer speak, but that's about the decision making, the court of protection, the lasting powers of attorney. I've got time for questions. How long do I have? I'm still good? Yeah, great. Okay, perfect. So, questions? Yes? Quick, is the letter of instruction the will? The letter of... Oh, the instruction, you know... Oh, okay, yes. Let's go back to that picture. Um, we talk about this a bit more this afternoon, but if I just tell you what that is, because that's uh, really interesting you picked up on that. Um, this the letter of wishes, wishes here? Wishes. Yeah. So, um, with a discretionary trust, so say I'm setting this up for when I pop my clogs, I'm going to choose my brother and my sister to be the trustees. And when I die, my house goes in there. And it's going to be all of those assets are used for the benefit of my Zach, who is vulnerable. What I want to do is to give these trustees some guidance about what they should and shouldn't do. So what I'd be saying in my letter of wishes is actually my Zach really loves going to football or he loves the PlayStation, all of those things. But also my aspirations about actually um, it may be that Zach is in a, in, a, in, a, in a very secure shared accommodation. And so I might be saying, well, in this case, I'm very happy for you to keep money and invest it and use it for him. Equally, if I'm worried about where he might live, I might be saying, well, actually, look, if there is no provision for where he lives or you think it's not that great, please buy a house out of here and use it for him to live in. So the legal structure of a trust is the three entities here, and your morally binding letter, which is capturing everything in your head, which is saying to your trustees, these are the things I want you to do for my child, that's going to be in the letter of wishes. The great thing about that is, you're going to pay to see a lawyer to do the legal stuff, and the lawyer's going to help you do that. But after that, the way we work, actually, after that, we give this to you as a Word document. So you save it at home on your computer, and then when you need to change it, because your child's circumstances will change, you know, 19 year old, uh, as a 19-year-old man and a 25-year-old is going to be completely different, then you just type in your new, you know, your, your amended instructions, print it off, sign, date it, send it to the lawyer, they store it with the trustee. So the letter of wishes is really powerful, and again, this afternoon, we talk about the letter of wishes a lot because it's so instrumental in this about what you should and shouldn't do. Yeah. Sorry, yes, is that letter of wishes actually they're legally binding on the trustee, so do they have to act in accordance with it? Yeah, interesting question. Um, the answer to that is no, uh, and there's, there's a couple of reasons why it can't be legally binding. The first thing is, if I did it today and didn't update it for 20 years, it's going to be completely outdated, so it can't be. But equally, if I did it today and I died today, and Zach's 19, it's going to be completely outdated by the time Zach's sort of 40, 45 in any case. So it's morally completely binding. It's also quite useful. So um, I'll give you an example that I used this afternoon. Uh, we had one of these that said, um, under no circumstances should you allow Zach to have a bungee jump. <laughs> okay, so these, the, the, the person, the parents died and the money went into the trust and the trustees were independent people and Zach was pretty switched on autistic lad, a 19 year old, he went straight to the trustees and said, I know I can't have any money, but I know I can ask you for it, trustees, I want a bungee jump. And actually what this enabled these trustees to do is to say, oh, I'm really sorry Zach, you know, I'd love to do that for you, um, but your parents have said here that they prefer you not to do that, so can we think about something else? So the great thing is it didn't prejudice the relationship between these two, but it was very clear what the parents wanted. Yeah, so it, it's a very powerful tool, but it's not, it's not legally binding in any way. Yeah, but just go to the back first, yeah. So who are the trustees? Do you choose them? Or? No, you choose them, yeah. Are this is your trust. So you, have, you can have a choice of family, friends, professional people, mixture of that. 
So, you know, if I've got, let's say, let's, let's say I was really lucky and had three children, one of whom is the vulnerable person, I might have my other two children as the trustees. Or if I've got family members, I might have those as trustees. Yes. Then you go to professional people. Yeah. So does this mean that the beneficiaries? Uh, it's kind of like someone they control, right? They haven't really got any. They've got. Well, you have to ask the trustees. Yeah. To I, yeah. And the, the difficulty is that, that you have to create that situation because if this person has the means-tested issues, the vulnerability, maybe capacity issues. You've got to take away part of that yeah. inheritance, or you've got to take away the inheritance and ring fence it for them. And that's why I said that the, the relationship between these two is really important because this person might have capacity and just have that means tested thing. Yeah. So, you know, the means tested means that, that we've got to put the money in here, but this person's got full capacity. So, what we want to do is encourage these people to work really closely together so there is no issues for asking for money to be used. Well, yeah, you, you need to you need to think very carefully about the word discretion. So, setting up a monthly payment might not be viewed to be a discretion as such. Um, so, what you need to think about is you can do a discretion for a year. So, you say for a year I can do this, uh, and then after that it changes. But yeah, you need to be very careful about the discretion. I mean, I've situations change, but and I've got some of the both yeah. of my children, I would say, probably could, he hasn't got the in the stomach, you know, uh, the capacity problems. Yeah. It's just the vulnerability side. Yeah. I, I just and it's good. You, yes, you modify it, you don't yeah. have to go all the yeah. way out to make any decisions. And I think the thing with that is that, that you need to talk to that individual and explain to them why you're doing what you're doing and explain to them you're not taking anything away from them, you're just making sure that things are safe just in case health issues come on later on, you know, all of those future problems. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it is, it's, a, it's a difficult thing if, as a parent, yeah. but it's a, it's a conversation that we've got to have. Case, but it's just you think of situations it is now, you're thinking, yeah. gosh, you know, if you can still do anything, we've got to kind of almost like... Yeah, the, the, but the really important thing is you've got to think up ahead and think about protecting for the future. That, you know, that's, but that's why the choice of trustees is so important. Yeah, I'm really sorry, I have got to wind up um, because I've yeah. So the next session is now about to start. Like I said, I'm doing two sessions this afternoon. I'm around for lunch, so come and have a chat to me. Thank you. Thank you.